so now we're going to analyze the bound states of the finite square wheel uh, where xi of x is an odd function. So in the example in the book, in Griffith's uh, demonstration, he treated xi of x as an even function. So now we're also going to deal with the case where xi of x is an odd function. So we know that from a question uh, 2.1, we know that xi of x for a given energy level, it could either be an even function or an odd function. So in the example in the book, when they dealt with the even function, where xi of x is an even function, that only gave us uh, parts of the solution. So for the case where xi of x is an even function, we got some of the allowed energy levels. But then we should also consider the cases where xi of x is an odd function. And by considering these cases, this will give us the rest of the solutions. And so that's what we're going to do now. We're going to look for the rest of the solutions. And those will come in the form where xi of x is an odd function. So if xi of x is an odd function, then xi of x is going to look something like this. So you can check for yourself that this expression satisfies the Schrodinger equation for the three regions uh, larger than a between negative and positive a and smaller than negative a. And then with this expression over here, you will be able to check that xi of x is indeed an odd function. So in order to check if a function is an odd function, you just check whether f of negative x is equal to negative of f of x. And you will be able to check that uh, this is indeed true for this expression over here. So right now we have three unknowns that we need to solve. We have f and d and also the energy level e, which is contained within k and l over here. So don't forget k is equal to the square root of negative 2m e divided by h bar, and l is equal to the square root of 2m e plus v naught divided by h bar. So now we're going to uh, to come up with some equations that would allow us to deduce what the energy level E should be. So in order to do that, we're going to consider the continuity uh, requirement at x is equal to positive and negative a. And because this is an odd function, we only need to consider the continuity requirement at one side, and if we do that, the other side will also be automatically continuous as well. So first we consider the fact that xi of x needs to be continuous at x is equal to a. So this implies that f times e to, the power, uh, e to the power of negative ka is going to be equal to substituting a into this expression, so d sine la. And then also we know that uh, d psi dx should also be continuous. And so differentiating this we get negative k f e to the power of negative k kx. So this is for x is larger than a. And then for this section we have L d cosine L x between negative a and positive a. And then this function needs to be continuous. And so if I substitute in a for both of these expressions, they should be the same. And so this gives me this relationship. Negative k f e to the power of negative k a is equal to L d cosine L a. And so now you have two equations. So what we're going to do next is that we're going to take this equation and then divide it. Uh, we're going to take this equation and divide it by this equation. And so for the uh, left-hand side, we're going to get negative k. So you can see that the f and the e, they both cancel out. And then for the right-hand side, we have uh, the d's, they both cancel out. So we have an l, and then we have a cosine divided by sine. So that's equal to cotangent LA. And so this is what we get. And so now we're going to do the substitution, where z is equal to LA. Recall that this is exactly what we did uh, in the example in the book. When we were dealing with uh, even, where when we were dealing with the case where xi of x is an even function, so we're doing the exact same thing. So I'm just going to multiply both sides by a. You can see that this is equal to z times cotangent of z, and then this a k over here we can simplify this. So we call that uh, let's, we can consider this expression a squared times k squared plus l squared. And don't remember, don't forget k is equal to the square root of negative 2me, so k squared is just equal to negative 2me divided by h bar square. l squared is equal to 2m e plus v naught divided by h bar square. And then obviously these two cancel out, so in the end you're going to get 2m v naught a square divided by h square. And then we're going to define this as being equal to some constant z naught square. So this implies that z naught is equal to a divided by h bar times the square root of 2m v naught. So you can see that <clears throat> using 
uh, z0. This, uh, by defining this constant, we can further simplify the left-hand side. You can see that we have an ak over here. And then from this expression, you can see that uh, this expression is equal to z0 square. So you can see that a square k square is equal to uh, z0 square minus a square l square. And don't forget, a l is defined as being equal to z. So this is equal to z0 square minus z square. And then we just take the square root on both sides. So k is equal to the square root of negative 2 m e divided by h bar, right? This term is strictly positive, so we don't need to consider the case where uh, the negative case. So we just have the square root of z naught square minus z, z square, and that's equal to a k. And so here we have negative z naught square minus z square. And so this is the transcendental equation we're going to, going to be interested in. So we can rearrange this uh, a bit more. So you get cotangent of z is equal to, actually the negative of cotangent of z is equal to z naught divided by z square minus one. So this is the transcendental equation we are interested in. So if we can find the value of z for which this equation is satisfied, then we would be able to deduce what L is, which would allow us to deduce what the energy level E is. So uh, this is a transcendental equation, that's why we can't find a closed form solution for this. So in order to find a solution for this, we need to graph the, the functions. So let's just draw this out. This is z, this is f of z, and then negative cotangent of z, it actually looks something like this. So this is pi, this is 2 pi, this is 3 pi. Cotangent of z actually looks something like this. So it's kind of like a tangent graph, but it's shifted. So this is negative cotangent of z, don't forget the negative sign. And so this, this just keeps on going, so pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, and so on, it keeps on going. And then this right-hand side expression over here, this is the same, exact same expression that we had uh, for the case when we were dealing with the case when xi of x was an even function. And then uh, you can check back that video if, you, if uh, you're not familiar with this, but this graph is going to look something like this. So let's say uh, the value z0 takes on a value of somewhere over here. So this, gra uh, this expression over here is going to look something like this. It's going to come down and then it is going to intersect the z-axis at z0. And then these three intersection points so in this case, it will, we will have three intersections. So if z0 is larger, then you will have more intersections. But in this case, you can see that these we have three intersections. And then these three intersections will represent the three values of uh, the, the values of z for which this equation is satisfied. So you will be able to take these values of z, and then you will be able to find what your L should be, which would help you find what your energy allowed energy levels are. So we could uh, explore some of the uh, limits. So we could first consider the case of a wide and deep well. So for a wide well, that implies that a uh, the width of the well a is going to be uh, a sufficiently large number. A deep well means that v naught is also large, and then this implies if a and v naught are large, that implies that z naught is going to be large, and if z naught is going to be large then this graph is going to intersect the z-axis at a very far location. And so your graph is going to be way up top over here, and then it is going to intersect the cotangent graph at locations very close to pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, and so on. And so that is, for, so for the case for a wide and deep well, uh, your solutions z is going to be approximately equal to n pi, where n is equal to 1, 2, 3, and so on. So you get this n pi based on the intersections over here. And then uh, z, don't forget, is equal to a l. So this is equal to a l. So l is equal to n pi divided by a. And then actually I'm going to re uh, change uh, this n term a bit. I'm going to change it into an m. And then I'm going to put a 2 down here. So this means m is equal to 2n. So it's going to be equal to 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on. And I'm doing this because I, I want to keep this 2a down here. So this 2a represents the width of the finite square well. And then you'll see in a minute why I'm doing this. So don't forget L is equal to uh, the square root of 2m v0 plus e divided by h bar. So if I, uh, if I square both sides, you will see that v0 plus e. So this represents uh, the energy difference between the energy level and the bottom of the well. 
this is equal to m squared pi squared h bar squared divided by 2m 2a squared. So where m is equal to 2, all, all the even numbers. And so you can see that this is exactly the formula for the energy levels of an infinite square well. And in this case, m uh, takes on the value of even numbers. So if you recall the example in the book, we caught something very similar. But for that, for that case, uh, the, the, uh, the m's that we had uh, took on values of odd numbers. So it was 1, 3, 5, and so on. So this time, when we're dealing with the case where xi of x is an odd function, we, we obtain the cases, uh, we obtain the rest of the energy level. So this time, all, all these m's take on e even values. And so this is the case of a wide and deep well. Now for the other case, so for a narrow and shallow well, so if a, the well is narrow, that means a is going to be small. If it's shallow, that means v naught is also going to be small. That means z naught is going to be small. And you can see that if v naught is too small, it is going to intersect. So let's say your z naught is over here. It's going to intersect your z axis at this point. And then you can see that when uh, beyond z naught, this function actually does not exist anymore. When z becomes larger than z naught, then this value inside the square root is actually imaginary number. So the graph pretty much just stops after z naught. And you can see that for such a case, you have no intersections, so there are no solutions. So you can see that you can actually set a limit. So if z naught is smaller than, so this this point is at the intersection at this point is actually power over two. So if you want a solution, you would need to intersect the your z naught would need to be somewhere larger than pi over two for an intersection to occur. If it's smaller than pi over two, then there will be no intersections. So you can tell that for a narrow and shallow well, if uh, z naught is smaller than pi over two then there will be no solutions. And uh, this will give you the condition where uh, if I just substitute in the expression for z naught, which is a divided by h bar square root of 2m v naught smaller than pi over 2. So if I rearrange uh, this term a bit, so put the, put the a over here, put the h bar over here, and then square both sides, so you can see that if the potential is smaller than so pi square h bar square divided by 2m, 2a square. So this you can also write this out as pi square, h bar square, 8m a square. So if your v naught is smaller than this number, then there will be no solution. 